As a person with ADHD, I like to break up my tasks into smaller bits to be manageable so I can focus more and increase my chances of completing. I personally like to clean on Friday nights instead of Saturday mornings because trying to clean an entire space in the span of one day for hours on end is going to be too overwhelming for me. It's easier just to go room by room. And of course, when you have an open space, the living room, the kitchen, the dining area is just one large space. So I can compartmentalize the task in my head and just make it easier on myself. On an average, my living room area is always clean, but there's just some fine tuning that I have to do daily. I have to take the dust off the couch because I snack on the couch. I have to charge my LED lights because they really go out daily and it takes a while for them to charge up, approximately two hours for them to get to fully charge. I normally do this in the morning before I head out of work so they're good to go in the nighttime when I wanna use them, but I forgot that day. I need to vacuum the carpet and I need to buy a better vacuum. I lost the stick to this one. It's somewhere in this house and I just can't find it. But getting everything prepared at nighttime does make it easier when you wake up. It makes you have more hours to enjoy your weekend. When your space is clean, at least for me, I feel a little bit better about myself. There are certain rooms I may let get out of hand, but my bathroom and my living room are not going to be those rooms. Any place where company is going to see, I'm not going to let get out of hand. I have to wipe the bottom of the tables because my little sticky finger baby love touching the bottom of the glass. And I'm not replacing this table, so... This is just what I have to do. I have these kind of plasticky kind of mats. And the only thing that I can use to clean them is this um, sanitizing wipes. Sorry. I just had something in my eye. My eye is burning me. It's late. What time is it? It's, oh, gosh. Why is it midnight, 20 minutes past midnight? <laughs> I'm sitting here doing this voiceover. I just recorded this. So, so I cleaned. Everything you just see me doing, I just finished doing it. And right now I'm laying down watching um, the family. So my eyes are starting to burn. And I'm wondering why my eyes is burning. And it's because I'm tired and I need to go to sleep. I didn't even take a nap today. Oh, I always pick up the mat. I don't pick up the regular carpet, but I pick up the smaller carpet, the cowhide carpet, to sweep and mop underneath it. Because somehow, I don't know from where, most likely the kids wearing shoes in the house when I'm not around, That but there's dust on the floor. So I'm just cleaning that. And isn't it crazy that certain things get like dust on it, like the dust just accumulate? It's just dusty. I feel like I have a dusty apartment. So I, I, if I don't dust and mop consistently, like it will just create like layers of dirt on top of surfaces. And I don't like that. Like my allergies will be TikTok. And I don't want to wake up in the morning like making that honking sound, sound with my nose. So freshly mop, freshly clean. I could eat off the floors if I want to. And I'm going to get started on prepping what I want to make for Sunday dinner. Recently, I've got into the habit of prepping my food and marinating it because I used to rush my dinners. So I would defrost the meat overnight, then come home at the work, season it right then and there and cook it. And I found that I wasn't enjoying my food anymore. And the reason why I wasn't enjoying my food anymore was one, I wasn't cooking with love and, and two, I wasn't leaving my food to marinate. So since I've started planning and taking the time with making my meals, I've been enjoying my food way much more. Too much if you ask me, because you can tell for the past two weeks, I've been doing nothing but just eating junk 
and not going to the gym and working out. So two weeks, I have gained back like probably six or seven pounds. And I gained it in my midsection. So I made a commitment to myself for me to start going back to the gym, even when I don't feel like it every day. Because even though the majority of my workout is just me like using the Stairmaster and the elliptical, it actually cuts down on my belly fat. And when my belly is smaller, I look smaller. But then again, too, I'm also bloated because it's the time of the month. So I'm bloated right now. So it's not all just the poor eating. It's the poor eating and me being bloated. Nevertheless, clean up your dishes after you cook or clean as you go. It makes it easier. So my son had just cleaned the kitchen, but because I cooked, I have to clean it all again. And because it's me, so I'm disinfecting and wiping it down with bleach and wiping down the area with bleach. And just wiping up all the water because if you let water sit on the quartz countertop, it leaves these spots and they're very, very irritating. And I don't like looking at it. So I'm just pouring bleach down the sink too so to prevent like gnats. It's springtime. And here in Florida, like the gnats will come out. This is how you know you're done cleaning when you light the candle. Because it's something about lighting a candle in a dirty house that just does not sit well with my spirit. I now can enjoy a nice, clean space. I've given this gift of cleanliness to myself. Which is so funny because when I was a young girl, like a teenager, I was nasty. Like, I didn't like to clean. Like, my mother would make me clean, but I didn't like to clean. And it's so funny that now I'm in my own space. If it's not clean, I can't go to sleep. It doesn't sit right with me. I clean every day. Now, look at this. Mm, perfecto. I My room is already clean, so the, I cleaned it earlier in the week. So that's good to go. So now all I really have to do is clean my bathroom. The painters came to repaint the bathroom and they had to redo the tub because it started crackling. So they had to come and like resurface um, the tub. I don't know that thing that they come with, they roll it on, but you see how pristine and white it is? Yes, it's because they just did that. Like they had to wrap up the shower head and everything to protect it. So now I'm just putting everything back into the bathroom because they made me take everything down so they wouldn't get um, any of the spray on it. So they tied the garbage bag pretty tight. Well, I tied the garbage bag initially, but I guess when they came to do it, they then reinforced it with some like painter's tape. So I had to get the scissors to cut it down. And I'm just putting back up my shower curtain. I lost one of the hooks somewhere because I kind of took it out and the hooks were open. So now I'm missing one of the hooks and I have to go find it. I'm just re-putting putting back everything back in its space, getting the space together because I haven't been able to shower in this bathroom for 48 hours and it should be set by now. So I, they told me 48, but I just wanted to be really sure. So I kind of gave it a little bit more time. So I guess I did 72. And now I'm just putting everything back in space. I had to order the sticky tabs to put the shower baskets back up. So that should be delivered tomorrow. And I could put my shower basket back up and then organize all of my things in. So I'm going to do a uh, aggressive, aggressive dieting. It's, I'm going to have to cut out the size or have minimal size. Cut out 
the sweets and the candy and just save it for a cheat day because uh, the way my hips and my knees hurt right now. This is my breakfast. This is a Dan and Light and Fit of strawberry cheesecake. It's 80 calories, 12 grams of protein, and zero grams fat. It's actually good. This is so good and creamy. This little area over here is so. Dulce, you okay? I want to go to Sephora and smell Jackie Aina's um, new perfume. I know it's probably going to already be sold out. So I'm just going to get the Discovery set if that's not sold out. This is our ribs that I seasoned last night. So I have this all sealed up. So my oldest son, we were having a discussion just about history. And I don't talk to my kids about like how the relationship went, how it deteriorated. I don't really talk to them. Like, and I don't believe you really need to talk bad about your your kids' parents to them, no matter what. Like, I, I feel like sometimes kids do need to know the truth about certain things, but you, like when they're really young and impressionable, if you talk bad about a child's parent, other parent to the child, the child internalizes that and the child will feel bad about themselves. So you think you're hurting the other parent, but you're really hurting your child. So I don't, I've never really had those discussions with my kids, but now that they're older. I realize other parties have had that discussion with my kids and put thoughts and opinions in their heads because they, I guess they assumed I was telling my truth and telling my story because I don't even need to lie. But it was something that my son said to me um, regarding like my, like my involvement that bothered me and triggered me and it made me feel re-victimized because he was telling, he, like, you know, his impression was that like I'm angry or like I was quarreling or beefing. And I said, I was never beefing with anybody. I just removed myself. Like no, anybody have who I've ever like had any issue with, I just removed myself. If you're telling me that either you don't like something about me because I'm me, like I'm not gonna adjust myself to it fit you to make you happy or like make myself feel small to make you happy. I'm not going to shrink myself to make anybody happy. And I'm not going to just tolerate anything from anybody. So if I don't let you talk to me however you feel like, treat me however you want, disrespect me, and I remove myself from that environment, that's not me beefing with you. That's me protecting my peace. Because if you keep on doing that, and I start getting angry, when I start acting like you and I start doing a you on you, then everybody's gonna look at me like the bad guy because I'm petty and I don't know how to stop when I start things. I, I'll speak it too far. If you hit me with a feather, I think it's appropriate to hit you with a hand. I don't care what it was because nobody told you to hit me. So when I remove myself, I find that me removing myself from the lives of people, the stories and the narratives that they're running with, it's crazy. And so my son is sharing like his perception of what he thinks transpired or what happened. And it made me upset. And then it made me sit down and really take myself back there to with adult eyes because a lot of things that happened when because I was a teenage mom, so a lot of things that happened I was a child. I'm like I'm talking about 15, 16, 17. I'm a child. So I'm thinking about it. And coupled with the fact that I'm on my period, like it just made it worse. But it triggered me. And then when I realized I wasn't protected. I was a child that was not protected. Like I was failed. I was failed by all the adults in my life. I was failed by just everyone who was supposed to protect me. I was failed. Like I did not have that like uh, observant watchful intentional I, like, I was failed and then like I was left on my own to just cope with a lot of things that when I look at my children the amount of things even when I get upset at them and certain things I let them fall so they can learn a lesson so if, if my son wakes up late after I told him to go to sleep early if he wakes up late and, and, and misses the bus I make him find his own way to school 
get on the city bus and go to school because I'm not gonna drop you off to make it easy. So get on the city bus, take the hour and a half on the city bus so you can learn this is your future. If you don't get a car and you don't have a car, this is this is gonna be your mode of transportation and this is what you would expect. So make better decisions, right? But that's it. Like I wouldn't, if he came to me in a crisis, I'm not gonna tell my kid, figure it out, or I'm just gonna wash my hands with my kid. Like I'm not gonna do that. And I feel like that's what happened that when initially, when I became a teenager, like when I found out I was pregnant, like just the just the response and just the dynamic, like when I'm looking back, I'm thinking if that was to happen to any of my kids, that's not how I would react, yeah, right? That's not how I would support them. And just preventative care, period. Just preventative care. Because a lot of people think that, oh, kids are just supposed to know you're not supposed to do that. But the thing, oh, thank you, my love. But the truth of the matter is, some kids are gullible. And you know why some kids are gullible? Because the parents are gullible. And parents will see traits and qualities in you and hate you for the traits and quality that they possess, that they see in you. But they never did anything to address those traits and qualities. They, de they never did anything to help you not have those traits and qualities. I help my kids to be more confident than I am as a teenager. Come on, mama, you want, you want Capri Sun? You want a you hoo You want chocolate milk? No? But I told my sons because my oldest, I used to make sure I tell him, if you get a girl pregnant, you're gonna go make sure you take care of that girl because she's not gonna do it all by herself. So use a condom. I provided him with the condoms. I educated him about sex. I had those conversations with him. I I, I taught him a woman's ovulation cycle. I taught him that pre cum gets you pregnant. I, I, I had the whole speech. I, I taught him about getting tested. I taught him about the reproductive system. I taught, I, you, we even had the discussion that he could get a vasectomy and reverse it. And that, so he, like, cause he can't control a woman's birth control, but, but he can control his own birth control because and since there's no birth control for men, that's something that he could explore and something he could do. I've had that discussion with, with both my sons. The importance of how a pregnancy is not just a woman's responsibility, it's a man's responsibility and the role he plays in it and, and how not to be careless with his seed. I had that whole conversation with them. Why? Because those conversations were not had with me. And parents just assume, just telling their kids, oh, don't do it, is enough. But I made sure that I educated my kids about all that stuff, right? Nobody, like West Indian parents have a, you, they just don't want to tell you nothing. And they assume that you're supposed to magically know everything. And I'm not saying it's my mother's fault that I was a teenage mother because I knew what I was doing. But at the same time, I wasn't a child that was confident enough to be left my own devices like I really wasn't and when you have a gullible mother and a people pleasing mother chances are you're going to be gullible and people pleasing too because when you when you try to deviate from their thought process they reel you back in and convince you like that that thought process is right the like prioritizing men and centering men like the like getting married as a goal um I will say my mother taught me things like make sure I have my own edu get I, my own education, be educated, have my own money, have my own bank account, um, don't become financially dependent on anybody. But she didn't teach me like standards that I need to pursue. Why? Because she did not have standards. So I was not to put standards. I the only things that the standards that I had came from basic treatments like my dad never hit me. So that wasn't something that I was gonna tolerate. Nobody, re I don't like being yelled at or talked to aggressively. You gotta talk to me soft. And I was the last child and I was spoiled. I didn't accept that, right? So as soon as you start thinking you wanna raise your voice or get peacock chested with me, you gotta go. I grew up seeing my sister husband obsessed with her, like really obsessed with her. And that was my first idea of love. So I like romantic men. I like men who are very affectionate. If you one of those cold standoffish men, you you not gonna get anywhere with me because I I, I want to be hugged and kissed. Like I I want you to I, you need to find me attractive and you need to express that I need to know that you find me attractive. 
I, I like kind men. I like men who spend money because my father, my brothers, my brothers in law, they, I saw grow up, saw men spend the culture I come with, men spend money. So I like men who argue over bills and pay for everybody because that's normal. So so that wasn't the thing that was pulling me, but like, that's something that I saw. So I thought that was normal. But there's certain things, like my mother had a high level of tolerance for bullshit. And if you go to her and ask her for advice, she encouraged you to tolerate bullshit because she had a high tolerance for bullshit. I remember once, my mother, my ex-husband, and myself, we were in um, our, my home, and we were having a conversation. And my mother made a comment in front of my ex-husband that, oh, all men cheat. It's okay as long as you use a condom so you don't bring home any babies or any diseases. Excuse me? And I had to check her in front of him because I felt like that planted to see in his head like, oh, like, well, this is her mother saying it. That's okay. No, the fuck is not. Right? So, my son, given his perception of what he thought of the entire situation, made me... Made, it triggered me it really triggered me to the point that i had to have a deep conversation with myself in the mirror and tell myself i was just a baby and i forgive you because you didn't know any better because you was a child you were just a baby and i had to keep telling myself like i was just a baby i was just a baby and i had to make very adult decisions as a baby and I did the best that I could when I was making those decisions and given some circumstances and situations I could have fell in at least I had sense to know to walk away whereas I felt like my mother did not have that yes my love I'm coming but I know how to walk away like I may stay too long and that's where I do give myself like, I hold myself accountable like I, like I used to stay too long in certain situations but at least I walked away like it, I, I still walked away and some people may chastise me because some people think it's better to stay either because they want their kids to have all have the same father or they feel like marriage like you know God doesn't like divorce and all that stuff but it's okay to walk away from people and now that I'm older, I realize the greatest protection you have is when people know that you're not afraid to walk away. When you're not scared to walk away from a job, you're not scared to walk away from a man, you're not scared to walk away from anybody, you will be happy because you're not putting your happiness in their hands. Most of the times, the reason why people are afraid from walking away from things is because they invest their happiness, they planted that seed into somebody and they're waiting for it to grow. They're waiting for the seed to grow because they assume as the seeds grow their happiness is gonna grow that's too much that's too much power that's too much power to give to anybody so once you love yourself and you put all that into yourself and i have to say like i'm two years away from 40. i like the past six years i've been i've been working on loving myself and it really took time it, it took first acknowledging that i didn't love myself then starting to love myself then practicing like loving yourself and then making good decisions for yourself and it's worth it like you're the best relationship that you're ever going to have you're the best investment that you're you're ever going to have and the crazy part is when you do start loving yourself and investing your, in yourself those same people will come and try to test that and try to make you feel bad for picking you when they've been picking themselves the whole time so that should tell you something if i'm doing what you do but you see fault in what i'm doing when it mirrors what you've been doing that means you know what you what you're doing is wrong and you don't care. So so why should you care? But I'm like this close to going back to therapy. Like this close. Like I thought about it. I was like, do I need to go back? And I don't believe I need to go back because every time I go back, I'm like I'm very self aware, right? Like I might make mistakes, but most of the mistakes is because of a lack of knowledge, right? And once I I'm educated, whether it's imparted through someone else's wisdom or me ascertaining it for myself. When I go to therapy and I vocalize how I feel that I articulate it, I think because I know how to articulate my feelings and what I believe may be happening or what I'm, I believe is, is a trigger or the stem of the of the circumstance. Most therapists, because they have they go into it with a savior complex. 
especially black women therapists they go into it with a savior complex like they themselves have been through something and they want to feel like they're saving somebody else from pain and when they feel like they can't save you because you're too self-aware they kind of just you know they back up like they, they they don't put much effort into it and it's kind of hard because you know you can't force a relationship with therapists like any other relationship like you really need to find like that that therapist with the skill set the education and the ability to connect with you so if you can't build that rapport with them you'll just be in that session you, you pour your heart out you feel like they just they're just staring at you and it's hard to start up like uh, or find a new therapist because it, i hate you gotta because you gotta get you gotta bring them up to speed so every time you find a new ther therapist you gotta go from all the way from the beginning to help them understand who you are because they don't they're not magicians they don't magically know and it's exhausting so sometimes when i get triggered i just write it out i really just i just write it out because i'm like do i do i feel like going through that whole you know dating process with that therapist just to, for them to tell me what where by the time i go through all that like it's, it's so exhausting that i'm gonna get over it so at this moment i'm okay it really it really triggered me because, especially knowing that like my kids are 20 16 and 4. knowing that the older ones that people are still like having conversations about things or that people have expressed opinions especially because when i say i don't bother nobody i really don't bother nobody most of the time when people say stuff depending on what it is i just let you have it because i know i'm never gonna bother you ever again i just let you have it i'm not even gonna waste my time arguing with people because i'm not gonna try to convince you that my point of view is right i don't care i just leave you alone and it's usually when i leave people alone they realize oh and then they, then they start and then because I don't want to show you I'm the bad guy. Or because I won't let you play in my face I'm the bad guy. Because I'm supposed to be like, oh, well, at the end of the day, that's my child's father. And we're always going to know each other. No, go to hell. Go to hell with some skis on. And some and some jalapeno jewels on. Go to hell. Like, we don't need to be friends. I don't need to talk to you. You don't get that. That's a privilege. And you don't get to keep on having access to people that you try to play with. That's the consequence of your action. And if you think that you're a victim because somebody don't want to deal with you anymore because you feign sorrow when we both know you're not sorry about what you did because if you had another opportunity, you'd do it again. So why am I going to give somebody, especially when I realize the character and this version of me would never associate with somebody with that character. Why would I give you another chance? Like, I don't even want you around me. If, if I could turn back the hands of time and go back and I, have, and I was this self-aware now, then you'd never had a time of day. I wouldn't even look your way. You would never would have been within my my, my, my periphery. Never. So, and they like to say, well, for me, like, oh, you think people are beneath you. You are. If you were wondering, you are. Now that I think, I know you are. Because this version of me, when I look back, you are. You were. You were very beneath me. I didn't know my worth. So that's why I allowed you access to me. But now that I know better, I know that I'm better. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and try to be humble and, and, oh, we're all, no, I'm better than you. I know it and you know it. And that's the only thing we agree on.